Listener Production. This episode contains references to violent crime. Please listen with care. On the 6th of May 2006, a 45 year old woman disappeared from California's San Pablo. Almost two years later, her skull was discovered near a homeless camp six and a half kilometres away. Forensic anthropologist Ryburn Dobbs immediately picked up on key information other investigators didn't. Ryburn's findings were ignored by the police, including evidence pointing to the location of the woman's remains, which could have provided answers to both her family and investigators. In this episode, hear about the frustration of authorities prioritising certain victims over others, even when presented with compelling forensic evidence. My name's Catherine Fox. I'm a former GP, crime author and screenwriter. I'm enthralled by forensics and have spent thousands of hours researching for books and screenplays. So I thought, why not turn my research into a podcast? Every week, you'll be joining me in discovering how forensic science is helping solve high-profile crimes in Australia and around the world. When I went to school many, many years ago, I wasn't sure, I was interested in a lot of different things. And um, as a result of exploring different subjects and different majors and so forth, I found that anthropology had a good mix of all the things that I was interested in. And to be honest, when I first heard about um, forensic anthropology, it was in a, uh, a class, an introductory class on archaeology. And I thought, well, it's kind of gross. Why would anyone do that, right? Uh, so, um, but what happened was I ended up going to school at a place that had one of the very first board certified forensic anthropologists in the country. And it was a school that did a lot of forensic casework for major counties in Southern California and, you know, covering millions and millions of people. So there's a lot of work to do. And when it came to anthropology generally, you can approach that, especially in the United States, you can approach that from more of a humanities standpoint, social science standpoint, or you could come at it from more of a scientific standpoint. And so what I found really appealed to me was the kind of the scientific standpoint. And so I really started to engage with the the archaeology classes, the human anatomy and osteology, you know, study the skeleton, those classes. And then I just found myself getting more and more interested in it. And uh, it just kind of, it just kind of captured me. And, you know, like I say, we handled a lot of cases. So we had a lot of like real world examples and we went out on searches and recoveries and things like that. So it was just, it was probably just, first of all, my just love for the scientific end of things, but then just, just also the, the excitement of, of figuring things out, of, of kind of putting the pieces together from the skeleton, but also from the scene, but also from the circumstances. And so that's probably how, how I got into it. And plus I, you know, when I was a kid, I was in, into detective fiction and all that kind of thing. So that's probably part of it too. Do you remember your first criminal case? Yep. So uh, it was an interesting case. So what happened was I graduated uh, and uh, moved, my wife and I moved uh, to a different part of the state to to where we were from in Northern California. And the thing about forensic anthropology is, generally speaking, you know, you're not going to see a posting in the in the in the classifieds or in the you know in the on the job boards for a forensic anthropologist. You know, those things are usually done by people who are teaching college or maybe working in a coroner's office. So I stopped by my um, local sheriff's office because they were the sheriff and the coroner. And I said, hey, I just uh, graduated here. I have all this experience. I've done all these things. And um, I'd be, you know, I'd be happy to pitch in and help out if, if you want. And of course, I don't entirely blame them, but I think the first reaction was just you know, who's this guy walking off the street? It's kind of a ghoulish thing. Why does he want to look at our dead bodies? So at first that didn't really work out. That wasn't the way to approach it. But that agency, that sheriff's department happened to have an opening for an analyst. So I ended up, I needed a job. So I, I 
wound up with that job as an analyst and can't remember how much later, probably within the first few months, there was a case that came up and they called me. Uh, my, my office was literally across a sidewalk. I'd go out the door in my office and, and go into the door across the sidewalk in the corner's office. And they called me and so they said, hey, you know, we, we remember you and we have this case we want you to look at. So what it was, was a an informant. Somebody called the police and said, I heard that there's a person, there's a man who was shot and buried in a backyard about a year and a half ago. And so they called me and said, we went to the scene and sure enough, we dug in the backyard and there's a body. We brought him back to the coroner's office and we really need you to um, verify that it could be the person that we think it is. And I think part of it too is them saying, okay, well, we'll see if this kid has the chops or whatever to, to do this. So anyway, I went in and, and I did what I did and, and the, the body was, you know, pretty well decomposed. The, the extremities were, were down to the skeleton. The, the trunk um, was mostly was flesh, but it was all decomposed. And, and um, anyway, it was a pretty gruesome scene uh, or, or the remains were pretty gruesome. And so I came in there and I just, I did all my work and that included, you know, having to take apart part of the skeleton so I could do my examinations and measurements and things like that. And, and I came back with, um, with my assessment and it, uh, it pretty much validated what they thought had happened. And I found that the person had a, a gunshot wound to their forehead. And apparently some people were getting drunk in a backyard and, you know, or maybe in a house, but they're getting drunk and playing with a gun and that usually doesn't end very well. And so the, the shot was reported to be accidental, but you know, as one does, if you accidentally shoot somebody, they um, decided to bury him in the backyard. And so that was my very first entree to that kind of thing. And so from that, everything just kind of opened up and I started getting calls all the time. And then also from that, as an analyst, I got assigned to the homicide unit and became an analyst almost exclusively for them doing homicides, missing case, the missing persons, identified bodies, things like that. There's a couple of cases that are of particular interest that we'd love to talk about today. The first one is, we're using her initials, MG. How did you get involved in MG's case and what was the story behind that? This is an interesting case for a number of reasons, for kind of the forensic reasons, but also the societal reasons. So essentially, I got called to a scene in part of our county, and uh, the the call was near a homeless encampment. A skull had been recovered. So I went to the scene. It was actually it was still there. So I went to the scene, and there was this skull leaning up against a very short. I'd call it a retaining wall, but it was only about a foot and a half tall, maybe two feet tall. And I looked at the skull and I examined it. There was all kinds of, you know, sheriff's deputies and forensics people and homicide people there. And they're all looking for the body, um, for the rest of the body. And the scene happened to be kind of on a, it was on a slope. And I was looking around to see what the, the area looked like. And I could tell from looking at the skull uh, and looking at the area, I told every, I told the, the, the tech, as I said, that the rest of the body is not here. And the reason I could tell that is because on NG's skull, on the back of the skull, the occipital region, the back lower part of the skull, was a substance that is colloquially, it's called grave wax, but the um, the official term is adipocere. And it's basically fat that has been submerged in water of a certain temperature for a certain period of time, usually several months. And so I know I knew that the skull had been in water at some point, and where it was recovered, the, it was on a slope. There would be no standing water. But I looked at the skull. I did the assessment. It's Caucasian female. She had a massive hole on one side of her head, the left side of the head. And when I looked at the hole, um, you know, the, the first thing that was uh, suggested was that maybe she'd been hit inside the head and. I look at the hole, I thought, well, this looks actually kind of artificial. There was these kind of divots on the margin of the hole in the head. And um, come to find out that this person had a plate in their head. So the local law enforcement got some tips and we thought we knew who it was and, and we, we'll just 
for our purposes, call call her MG. But MG was a person who was um, living on the streets a lot. She had a really rough life. She was an alcoholic. She got into lots of bar fights, um, just really difficult times with um, abusive men. But they came to me and they said, okay, um, we think we know who this is. And there's a, a rumor that the rest of the body is buried under in a crawl space of a house. And I told him, I said, don't bother with that. She's not in the crawl space of a house unless there's a bunch of water in that house. And they said, uh, well, we're going to check anyway. So okay, that's fine. So they, they went and looked and she's not there. And I said, you know, she's really got to be probably in a creek somewhere. And, and it turns out that there were creeks nearby. And so we searched the creek and um, I can't remember what time of year it was, but I think the creek was pretty, the, it must've been spring because the creek, creek was pretty high. It was pretty difficult to search. And we, we didn't find anything at the time. And so I said, look, um, you know, I think we need, you know, we can keep looking. It could be downstream, could be anywhere. We can keep looking. And the agency, the law enforcement agency said to me, no, there's no evidence that this is a homicide and we're really busy with the gang stuff and all the other crimes. So we're not going to look at this and not going to look for her anymore. And I, uh, you know, as are right now. And I couldn't, I couldn't believe that. I, I was raised, you know, on TV forensics and crime shows, cop shows where you, you don't stop till you get your person and you, you find the solution. And that was a real eye opener to me. If this had been a person who was of more higher social standing, I really do think that there would have been more of an effort. But my response was, and I remember talking to the captain of our coroner division, and I said, look, and he said, well, the agency doesn't want to go out there because there's no evidence that it's a homicide. And I said, well, where do you think the evidence of the homicide is? It's probably where her body is. First of all, she has this plate in her head. It was a plastic plate, so kind of as a form of plastic plate in her head. So she could have been shot in the head and there could be an imprint of a bullet. There could be an imprint of a blow to the head of some sort or whatever. There could be all kinds of things. And um, they said, well, we're not going to do it. So like the next year, or maybe I think it was later that year, it was summer. And so the waters were down. And I was teaching a summer course on forensic anthropology at a local college. And I said, hey, I have 20 students in this class. Let us go look for, for MG. And they said, no, 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 because if you find her, it's going to be a whole thing. And that's just so counterintuitive. Even when they've got volunteers, this is somebody's family member irrespective of her life yeah and and she had a brother she had a brother who you know would call in every once in a while and not not calling me but calling the law enforcement and and ask about her I, yeah it was just such an amazing bucket of cold water you know after you know and i've worked with other agencies that were much different but this was just like you know and i saw that a lot especially with the homicide group where it was, there was a lot to do, not a lot of people to do it, and some things just didn't get done. So MG, like I said, she had this plate in her in her head, and so I reasoned that well, she's not a person of means; she's you know itinerant, and and it may very well be that her medical records are going to be at the county hospital where care is usually subsidized and cheaper, and so on. So. They ended up going to the county hospital, and lo and behold, come to find out that, yes, her records were there. Yes, at some point previously, she got into a fight in a bar and had a hematoma on her head. They had to take part of her cranium off and replace it with a plate. But then, as I was looking through those records, the records also indicated that she was in a very horrible car accident and had a broken forearm. I can't remember which side, but broken, no, it was broken humerus, upper arm. And so anyway, so a year or two later, I get called the same agency that says, hey, we found a bone. Well, people find bones all the time, right? There were 25 different law enforcement agencies in our county, and people were finding things all the time. So I mosey over there. The evidence technician hands me this brown paper bag, and it's got a bone in it, and he hands it to me. And I feel it, and I can feel it's a, it's a long bone, kind of a short long bone, so I, it's an arm bone. And as I'm feeling it, I feel this big bony knot in the middle of the shaft. And before I even, you know, I didn't even open it. I said to the guy, and it's the same guy I was, I had dealt with on that case. I said, this is MG's arm. Where'd you find this? And he kind of looked down cheapishly and he said, you found it in a creek. And so 
I opened the bag and looked at it, and you know, looked at it, and looked at it, and sure enough, it had green, some kind of green algae on it. It had been submerged in water, totally. And then, okay, well, great, we know where she is. We know where she is. Let's let's go. Let's go get her. No, we really don't have the manpower for that. I just, I was absolutely stupefied. So, you know, some cases work out really, really well, and some cases, the forensics, the evidence, the science leads you, you know, right to what you need to do, but. The you know social forces uh, you know the whole institutional thing gets in the way, and that's that's the case with MG. When the skull was found, do you believe it was put there or propped there, or was it in an area of water before that that had since receded? No, uh, that's a very good question. No, it was there was no water that would have come up the slope that far. There was no there wasn't a creek at the bottom of the slope. It was definitely brought there by somebody. And because that was a homeless kind of area encampment, the feeling was that some homeless person stumbled on it and thought, hey, this is cool, and and just carried it up the um, up the slope. It, it's very interesting. It sounds like you actually had an attachment to MG and her story right from the start. Well, yeah, I, I suppose I did. I mean, it, I mean, the the story itself is kind of heartbreaking. Just to have you know, there's people in society that just by you know, uh, is there circumstances many of which can't really be controlled, some that can, are going to have a completely different treatment. Because you remember, I mean, at this time, I was doing cases all over two different counties, and so I'd seen how different things were done and. This was just so starkly, I mean, why in the world would, I mean, first of all, the coroner has a duty, sworn duty to, to follow up and, uh, you know, and if, but the law enforcement agency didn't want to. So that was part of it. Just a feeling for her was part of it. But the other part of it was just, you know, you, you go through all this training and all this, um, all, all the process of finding all the stuff out and the, the the science and the experience reveal these great things to you and and you could utilize that and leverage that and then you can't so so you don't get to see the resolution and oftentimes that was the case with being a forensic anthropologist I didn't necessarily know all the resolutions but many times I did but in this case it just it didn't go anywhere In contrast to MG's case, you do have another case where you were able to establish an awful lot about the potential cause of death through examination of the skull. Can you lead us through that one? Sure. So this was, might have been, it was near Fremont. There was a, a canyon with some water flowing through it, a very busy road going through the canyon. It hooks, it, it hooks up some very populated areas of, of the East Bay. And uh, somebody, I don't remember exactly how they found the person, but they were driving through, I think, and they saw the person or they stopped to go to the restroom or something. But at any rate, there was a human body hung up in some branches near the edge of this of the, of the water. So they, uh, they, they, they recovered the body and they brought it in the coroner's office and they they asked me to come look at it, and I I when I got there I, I said well you know what do we have they said well it looks like the guy fell out of the back of a truck or something you got hit hit and run kind of a thing or we don't know it's just, it was on the side of the road right so that makes sense so sure so I started to look at it and this was simultaneously the worst trauma I'd ever seen and I hate to I hate to put it this way. Even though it was ghastly, it was the perfect example of something that you're normally only going to see in a textbook if you ever see it in your life, right? So I took the skeleton. It was a full skeleton, a full, essentially full body. There might have been some small bones missing, but essentially full body. Laid him out on the autopsy table, put him in an anatomical position, and the skull had incredible trauma to it. 
incredible drama. The lower jaw was broken such that there was a piece hanging off of the jaw. The upper jaw, the alveolus where the, the upper teeth are, was broken. There was about a there was a missing about two centimeter square piece missing out of it. Someone had completely just hit the skull and knocked that out. The forehead above, just above, well, just above the nose was separated from the rest of the cranium. So this person was beaten in the face repeatedly. And I could tell from the the breaks, especially the left side of the jaw, that whoever did this was, was swinging something blunt from their right side. So probably right-handed person. But I looked at the I looked at the rest of the body and everything was absolutely pristine, absolutely perfect. There was no trauma, there was no defensive wounds to the to the arms, what we call peri fractures. So the victim wasn't holding his his arms up to stop the blows. And so I I said to the detective, I said, This is not a it's not a car accident. This is not a hit and run or anything like that. This person was tied up and beat. And then I explained why that was so. Or could they have been unconscious when they were beaten? Um, yeah, well, sure, certainly they could have. Certainly they could have. But what I recognized in the skull was something that, uh, so after I got done with the examination, I went, I, I came back and I went through old articles that I had kept from um, grad school. And there was an article, the scientific paper from the early 1900s. I believe it was that. Uh, there was a doctor by the name of Rene Lafort, French doctor, who experimented with cadavers. He wanted to see what the face, what or what the skull, how the skull would react if you hit it with different things in different ways in different places. And so he came up with a kind of a schema to describe the different kinds of trauma. And so you have a Lafort one fracture, which is basically where the upper jaw is separated from the rest of the skull. You have a Lafort two, which is where just the nose is separated, that part is separated down. Then you have a Lafort three, which is the entire face is separated, removed from the top of the skull. This was a Lafort three fracture. This was an absolute perfect Lafort three fracture. And so even though looking at it, I thought this must have been absolutely horrible. It was by the same token, just from a scientific standpoint, it was just the most amazing thing I'd seen. So, th- again, this is one of those things where you know, I, I did my report, I came up with um, sex, age, ancestry, that kind of thing, and reported, to, you know, gave my report into law enforcement. And this is one of those things where it was about a week went by, I hadn't heard anything in the news about it. And so, you know, I didn't know. What, what was going on. So I actually, I just did an internet search and it turns out they had identified the guy and they had it arrested four people, three or four people. It was a, it was a drug ripoff, but it was also a mistaken identity thing. They thought this guy was, was a drug dealer. And so, but he wasn't, but they tied him up to a chair and they beat him with a golf club at the head. So that was a, that was a homicide Four people arrested I think they they must have pled out because I was given the subpoena to testify, and then I never had to testify. So they must have they must have pled out. But that was you know that the the forensics, the body, the skeleton told a very specific story, and that one really really helped with that case because if if they, I mean no one's going to fall out of the back of a truck or get hit by a car, and the only thing that breaks is their face. Were you able to establish? in terms of any possible weapon, given that degree of damage, or because of the number of blows and the severity, did that affect your thoughts on what possible weapon it could have been? Well, I knew it was blunt, because if it was a sharp-edged weapon, there would have been, it would have left specific kind of marks on the bone. It would have left kind of incised marks on the bone, you know, linear marks. But this was this was just great chunks. This was literally pieces of the face being knocked off. So this was something that had a lot of weight to it, a lot of force to it, uh, width to it. So I knew it was blunt. Didn't know exactly what, and it could have been 
done with a lot of different things. Could have been a golf club, could have been a baseball bat, could have been a lot of things. We've actually spoken to a lot of experts about their experiences in court testifying. And given that you're in in the United States, it'd be really interesting to hear your experience when you've given expert testimony. What it's interesting because I'm a, you know, rather uh, experienced teacher and and uh, give trainings and lectures and keynotes and things like that. So I'm not afraid to speak, but when it comes to court, for me it's very nerve-wracking because from from I'm usually testifying all but one time I've testified for the prosecution, and you know the, the the entire defense their entire job is to make you look bad, right? So, however they can do that, make you seem unqualified or or just try to trip you up, and so that is really nerve wracking. But what's interesting about it is, it's one of those things where um, it's a very adversarial environment, right? There's no Sure, coding it. It's like they're, they're there to pick at your every single word and motion and, and all that. But what's really interesting is I've had many, many times where I've kind of gotten really nervous about the cross examination where I will have done my bit for the prosecution and then it'll be the defense's turn. And I'll kind of take a deep breath and I'll go, oh, here it comes. And then many, many times the defense attorney will ask me something or ask me something in such a way that I go, oh, he has no idea what he's talking about. Okay, this is going to be fine, (laughs) right? So it's kind of a relief when you, you know, when uh, you get yourself worked up, right? But you have to remember that that you're the the expert and an expert is somebody who knows more than the average person. And so you're the expert. I think the longest time, longest I've ever been on Sam was like five hours. Um, Some people have been on a lot longer, but it's just, really intense. And then when you're done, you just take a deep breath and and walk away. Before you testify, do you work with the prosecutors in terms of sort of questions to ask to to be able to reveal this information or reinforce the information? Do you work with them or do you go in cold? Oh, no. You, well, if you're, if you're testifying for the prosecution, they're definitely going to meet with you and talk about, and, and, you know, talk about the things that they want to emphasize you know, that they don't put words in your mouth, but they, you know, they, they're going to talk about the things, the pieces of your testimony that are really critical. So, yeah, I mean, they, um, and just depends on the nature of the case, how much of that goes on. Sometimes it's just, hey, show up and you're going to read part of your report and, and that'll be it. But yeah, you definitely work with the, um, with the prosecutor. I, I have one interesting, like I said, I've testified for the defense one time and, at, uh, the district attorney, the prosecutor, got up, um, and I, I, I wasn't, you know, I was, I wasn't unwilling to testify. I mean, I just thought it was so odd. But anyway, the defense guy called me, and the prosecutor got up, and she did what all prosecutors or all all adversaries are going to do in that situation. She tried to discredit me, and later on, I said, I gave her her name, but I said. Do you realize if you dis- if you were to discredit me, you have jeopardized every case I've ever testified for you. It was just I was like, don't go, t- yeah, don't go too hard there, ma'am. You know, I didn't say that from the stand, but it was just kind of funny. In terms of forensics cases, justice and injustices, a lot of people find their cup sort of fills up, and there comes a time when they have to take a step back or leave the area. What happened with you? In terms of ongoing career, I I was a person who was burning the candle at both ends. I was working as an analyst with the homicide unit, and were and I was on several task forces. I was on the Golden State Killer Task Force and a bunch of other uh, task forces. I was the forensic anthropologist for two different counties. I was also teaching anthropology at two different colleges in the Bay Area. And I did that for over 10 years. And then ultimately what happened was my work as an analyst got me some some recognition and I got recruited by a private company to come work for them. And there it, it was a company that consulted with law enforcement. And so I did that and I became a corporate person. And, you know, that was not fun at all. I, I was not a corporate person. I love the forensics. I love the teaching. And looking back, it was probably mistake. So it wasn't that I was 
burned out at all by the cases. In fact, I love the cases. Being a college teacher and working cases was a perfect match. Like I remember one time I was teaching, I was I was teaching a section on human growth and development. And it was the same day that I had just analyzed the skeleton of a 12-year-old homicide victim. So I could talk about the growth of the skeleton and determining age and things like that. So it was really it was really great kind of marriage of of the academic teaching uh, kind of thing, but also the real world cases. But what happened was I just got really, really overworked. So when I went to the corporate thing, I found myself with a lot more time. And so what I did was I thought there was two things. When I went to school, there's two things I knew I wanted to do. I wanted to teach and I wanted to write, but I never really did write, but but I started teaching. And then when I went to the kind of the corporate world and got quickly disaffected and burned out with the corporate world and found myself with some little bit of time, I decided, um, you know, it's time it's time you check the writing box. And I thought, well, I really don't have anything to write about. I mean, you know, and then it just occurred to me, actually, I have a lot of really cool material. And so when I went to, uh, you know, when I, when I was in my corporate job, I used my free time to write my first book and publish it. And it got really great feedback, really great reviews. It's the first fiction I'd ever written. And essentially, I used my cases and a lot of a lot of my cases in my books not necessarily verbatim the circumstances aren't the same but the forensic elements are the same you know in my first book i have a body on a slope i have a lafort fracture in one of my books i have all you know i have all these different things and so i wrote the first book you know it did relatively well it got well reviewed then i wrote the second and that one did a little bit better and then i wrote the third and so I just really found that writing gave me a lot of joy. And it was probably, it was the hardest thing I've ever done, but it was the most joyful thing I've ever done. The thing I loved about transitioning from medicine to crime writing, because I did a similar thing, I've written eight novels. The thing I love the most is that you get justice in your own books. And to me, that's quite cathartic. And, and it sounds like it is for you too. Yeah, it absolutely. It was cathartic in that way for sure. It was really great to kind of squeeze out all of my experiences, not just forensics, but working close, very close to law enforcement for years and years and years. And so, you know, a lot of the feedback I get is that my characters are really authentic. And, they all, and the other thing I get is that I have a really good way, clear way of explaining the forensics, uh, you know, explaining things because I have characters explaining things to other characters. And that's because I taught for so long and I had to explain my work to people that weren't trained, you know, officers and so on that weren't trained in that. It was a lot of, a lot of great experiences, a lot of fun, and but especially fun to find out that, that the thing that I wanted to do my whole life that I was actually not too bad at, you know, and, and people enjoyed it and, and want more. So, and the other thing too is, I'll just say really quickly, because this doesn't get really highlighted very much, is that my books, I wanted them to be, you know, at first I kind of aspired to some sort of literary fiction and my editor said, you you don't have literary fiction, this is crime fiction. So, okay, fine. But I wanted kind of some real character driven stuff. And so I have some mental health issues in there. I have a little bit of humor. I have, I didn't mean to, but I have a little bit of romance in there. Didn't see that coming at all. I have some family dynamics, families being kind of, you know, broken families being repaired, that kind of thing. So, yeah, there's a lot of just squeezing out of humanity and experience in, in the books. If people want to read your books, and I'm sure they will, where can they find them? So if you look at my name, Ryburn Dobbs, R-Y-B-U-R-N-D-O-B-B-S, you'll find them. But uh, the first one is called The Comfort of Distance. The second one is The Boxwood or so. And the third one is called Where the Blood is Made. And fourth one, To Be Determined. Robin, this has been really, really fascinating. And I love that you're a crime writer as well. And what I particularly 
really admire is the humanity that you've shown in, but you know, especially with cases like MG, that you really connected with the person, and that's no doubt coming through in your teaching and everything you do. So, thank you very, very much for not just joining us, but for your contribution to forensic science. Thank you very much. It's been a great pleasure. Crime Insiders Forensics is a listener original production. It's hosted by me, Catherine Fox, and produced by Holly Mitchell and Ed Gooden. Sound design and imaging is by Link Kelly.